Welcome to the third Harvard Korean Security Summit. My name is John Park, director of the Korea Project at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. The goal of our annual event is to grow the Korean security studies field by bringing together top researchers, senior ROK and US practitioners, and next generation scholars. Convened by the Belfer Center's Korea Project, the summit is the anchor event for the Korean security studies field at Harvard University. Our thanks to the Korea Foundation for their generous support of the Korea Project and the third Harvard Korean Korean Summit. This year, our theme is Korea, a catalyst of global trends. To further explore this theme, our panels over the next three days will cover the following topics. Panel one examines enhancing security on the Korean Peninsula. Panel two focuses on building mutual prosperity through resilient technology supply chains. And panel three centers on addressing North Korea's cyber criminal statecraft activities. Our day two keynote speaker will be Tammy Overby, president of Asia Pathfinders and former president of the US-Korea Business Council. Our day three keynote speaker will be Jean Lee, host of the BBC World Service podcast, The Lazarus Heist, and former Pyongyang bureau chief with the Associated Press. We'll have closing remarks by Consul General Ki Jun Yu of the Korean Consulate General here in Boston. For our kickoff today, it's my pleasure to introduce Natalie Colbert, will be giving the US opening remarks. Natalie is the executive director of the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. Before coming to the center, Natalie served in the Central Intelligence Agency for 13 years. Most recently, she was director of analytic resources and corporate programs for the Near East Mission Center, where she led strategic management of analytic personnel resources and created a career development seminar for mid-level analysts. We're delighted to have you launch our summit today. Over to you, Natalie. Great, thank you so much, John. It's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the Belfer Center and the Belfer Center leadership. And so I'd like to add my welcome to you all to the third annual Korean Security Summit hosted here at HKS in the Belfer Center. Um, as John mentioned, this annual summit brings together top researchers of Korean security studies, as well as senior ROK and US practitioners and next generation scholars. And as, as John highlighted for the panels upcoming in the conference, among our distinguished participants, we are really truly privileged to have the Honorable Foreign Minister of the Republic of Korea, Dr. Park Jin, and the Korea Foundation President, Dr. Gun Lee with us today for their addresses. So my thanks to you both for joining us. As John introduced, the theme of this year's summit, Korea, a catalyst of global trends, is really intended to explore how quickly various career-related functional issues play out in ways that can really have global implications. And in that sense, Korea cases often provide sort of a unique and leading insights into global trends that range from everything from ongoing efforts to change leader-level calculus, for example, during the 2017 Korean Missile Crisis, to the Republic of Korea's designs for bolstering tech supply chain resilience, as well as the DPRK's expanding use of cryptocurrency theft for funding the regime. So really thinking about some of the ways in which the dynamics happening on the peninsula are shaping the way we view some of these larger trends globally. But what I wanted to do is take a minute as, as reflecting on, on the Belfer Center here, as we prepare to launch into these discussions, I wanted to take a moment to connect the convening of this summit to the Belfer Center and the Korea Project and what makes us unique as a place to convene these discussions. So as many of you know, we have two traditions that drive our work here. The first is bringing together leading scholars, senior practitioners to unpack, to examine, and really try to make sense of the underlying factors behind complex policy challenges. And the second tradition is mentoring the next generation of leaders, um, both scholars and practitioners. And the Belfer Center has long-standing programs that are designed to cultivate and create early opportunities for the talented next generation of thought leaders to really um, join study groups, advance research, and take on a role in shaping what we think of as policy relevant research and engage with senior practitioners working on these challenges. And many of the members of, the, of our community in this sense go on to serve at some of the highest levels of government. And as a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School myself, and now as a member of the center working to advance this work, I can speak firsthand to the impact that this mentoring can have on new generations of leaders. And in my time in, as the executive director here, I can really say that the Career Project stands out to me for the innovative and proactive ways that it advances these traditions. And it's these two driving forces that are behind the Career Project's vision for this summit and more broadly for the work that it does to grow the field of Korean security studies. 
So with that, I'll, I'll add my thanks in advance to all of the terrific speakers and the moderators that we have lined up for the panel sessions throughout the next three days. And as well, I would also like to thank um, members of the audience who I know are joining us from three continents, multiple time zones. So appreciate everyone um, taking the time to join the Korea Project, the Belfer Center, and the participants in this conference to really engage on these, on these topics. So with that, John, I'll pass it back to you. Natalie, thank you very much. Thank you for officially getting us underway for the third Harvard Korean Security Summit. For our ROK opening remarks, we now turn to Dr. Gun Lee. Dr. Lee was appointed president of the Korea Foundation in September 2019. Prior to his appointment, he was professor of international relations at Seoul National University and the Graduate School of International Studies, where he was also dean of the Office of International Affairs. We'll now turn to Dr. Lee's ROK opening remarks. Good evening and good morning, everyone. I'm Kun Lee, president of the Korea Foundation. It is my honor to welcome you all to the 2022 Harvard Korean Security Summit, the third iteration of this annual forum, uh, which serves as an anchor event of the Korea Project. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Honorable Dr. Ash Carter, Director of the Belfer Center, and Dr. John Park, Director of the Korea Project, for organizing this meaningful and timely event. The Korea Foundation is very proud to support the Korea Project and the Korean Security Summit, which have successfully served as a comprehensive dialogue channel for the discussion of critical matters that affect our common interests. Taking this opportunity, please allow me to briefly introduce the activities of the Korea Foundation. The Korea Foundation carries out a diverse array of international exchange programs around the world, including the promotion of Korean studies, networking to foster international cooperation, arts and cultural exchanges, and media projects. Over the past three decades, our unwavering commitment to Korea-US cooperation has remained especially strong with a heavy emphasis on programs with US partners, which include prominent research institutes and universities. Dear guests, today's forum could not have come at a more opportune time since we observed significant policy changes and initiatives following the launch of the new Korean government under President Yoon Suk Yeol in May. During his first summit meeting with President Biden two weeks after his inauguration, the two leaders agreed to upgrade our country's bilateral alliance to a global comprehensive strategic alliance, reaffirm their common goal of the complete denuclearization of North Korea, and agreed to launch an economic security dialogue. In fact, Korea's alliance with the United States built on mutual trust and shared values such as freedom, democracy, and human rights is stronger than ever. Moreover, our, our alliance is no longer defined by defense concerns alone, but by our strategic economic and technology partnership. I am truly confident that together, the United States and the ROK can tackle the pressing challenges presented before us in Northeast Asia and beyond. As the world's 10th largest economy and equipped with a modern military force, Korea cannot merely remain a local or regional power, but ought to contribute to the peace and well-being of the global village and planet Earth as a global leader. Korea could not have accomplished its economic success without an open global market and a stable rules-based international order. I believe that Korea is, a, is on an irreversible path to transforming itself into a genuine global pivot state and as a global stakeholder, now is the time for Korea to propose to and show the world how it can strengthen and enhance global public goods together with like-minded nations, especially the United States, Korea's strongest and most important ally for over 70 years. Dear colleagues, 
the situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula has never been as challenging as it is today. North Korea's pursuit of nuclear capability has never been stronger. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the rise of technologically advanced China pose economic security challenges to Korea. Korea and Japan, the two like-minded democracies in Asia, still cannot find mutually agreeable solutions to their history issues when the bilateral cooperation has never been more important. Against this backdrop, we will, over the next three days, explore issues ranging from efforts to enhance regional security and cybersecurity to our case pioneering policies to bolster supply chain resilience in key technologies and critical minerals. With the most influential scholars and opinion leaders invited from the United States and Korea, I have no doubt that this year's summit will be a milestone on the way to establishing a truly global comprehensive strategic alliance between the two countries. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Dr. Gun Lee, president of the Korea Foundation for the ROK welcoming remarks. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Dr. Pak Jin, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Dr. Pak Jin is a proud graduate and certainly someone we are very proud of in the Kennedy School community of being an alumni of the community here. He received his DPhil from Oxford University and also pursued additional graduate studies in the UK. As a member of the National Assembly and as also as a thought leader in the think tank community, we have come to regularly interact with Dr. Pak Jin over the years. And today we're very honored to have him uh, present the congratulatory remarks for the third Harvard Korean Security Summit. Distinguished guests, friends, and fellow supporters of the ROC US Alliance, members of the faculty, fellows, and students of Harvard University. First of all, I would like to thank the Belfer Center of Harvard Kennedy School and Dr. John Park for your kind invitation. I myself studied at Kennedy School in the mid 1980s, and it feels like a homecoming to meet you all today, although virtually. Distinguished guests, the third Harvard Korean Security Summit could not have come at a more opportune moment as the world is facing multiple challenges. Close to our home, North Korea is posing a serious security threat, not only to the Korean Peninsula, but also to the international community. North Korea has continued to upgrade its missile and nuclear capabilities in flagrant violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions, while even threatening the preemptive use of its nuclear weapons against the South. Over the past years, North Korea has increasingly tapped into illicit cyber activities, which may have become a lucrative source of income for its WMD programs. Moreover, our cherished universal values and the rules-based international order are also under serious threat by Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, which violates the UN Charter and international law. In the meantime, the global pandemic and climate change continue to threaten our daily lives. Against this backdrop, the Yoon Song Yeol government has laid out a diplomatic vision of a global pivotal state, whereby Korea commits to take on a greater role and responsibility in addressing the common challenges that we face today. With its national standing as the 10th largest economy, Korea will endeavor to do its part in promoting the rules-based international order, as well as upholding the universal values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Distinguished guests, during the Korea-US summit that was held just 11 days after the inauguration of the Yoon Song-yeol government, our two leaders agreed to develop our partnership 
into a global comprehensive strategic alliance. The Rock US military alliance, which was forged in blood seven decades ago, is still at the very core of our ties. In particular, US extended deterrence had been the key element and has become all the more critical given North Korea's escalating missile and nuclear threats. Also, sharing our unwavering belief in democracy and universal values, we are perfect partners in tackling the increasingly complex challenges that the world faces today, such as supply chain disruptions and cyber security threats. Therefore, the theme of the third Harvard Korean Security Summit, focusing on resilient technology, supply chains, and North Korea's cyber criminal statecraft activities touches the pressing issues of our alliance. I'm confident that today's discussion will provide invaluable insights and policy recommendations to both our governments to further strengthen our global comprehensive strategic alliance. Lastly, I sincerely look forward to meeting you all in person in the not so distant future. Thank you. Our deep thanks to Foreign Minister Park for joining us uh, this evening with his remarks. Thank you. Before turning to our first panel, I ask our speakers to remain muted with their videos on. We have a terrific group of experts to dive into the panel one topic of enhancing security on the Korean Peninsula. Moderating panel one is the award-winning correspondent, Nick Schifrin. Nick is a foreign affairs and defense correspondent for PBS NewsHour in Washington, DC. He leads NewsHour's foreign reporting. And with the numerous awards, among them the highlights, the PBS NewsHour series Inside Putin's Russia won a 2018 Peabody Award and the National Press Club, uh, Club's Edwin H. Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence. In November 2020, Nick received the Academy, uh, American Academy of Diplomacy's Arthur Ross Media Award for Distinguished Reporting and Analysis of Foreign Affairs. Thanks so much for joining us today, Nick. Over to you. John, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here uh, for our first panel, uh, which I'm excited to announce, Enhancing Security on the Korean Peninsula. And that, of course, is a combination of bolstering deterrence uh, and exploring the possibility for diplomacy. Um, and so the, the kind of strategic situation, just to make a couple of points at the top here, we've got a new UN administration uh, in Seoul, uh, who of course we've just heard about their priorities. Uh, number two, what they called a serious security threat, of course, North Korean uh, capacity, uh, especially improved uh, recently when it comes to its missile launches, 23 missile launches this year, uh, including uh, ICBMs, a series of launches right as President Biden left the region, and the recent announcement of strengthening deterrence uh, along the border, which we should examine as well. Uh, a complex China nearby, uh, and also the US shaping its Indo-Pacific strategy with a little more specifics, uh, and talk a, a little bit there about Japan as well. Uh, so I'm honored to be uh, joined by distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Yoon yong Hwan, uh, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, from the Republic of Korea, uh, General Vincent Brooks, senior fellow here at the Belfer Center, uh, as well as former commander, uh, ROK US Combined Forces Command. Uh, General Lim Ho Young, the president of the Korea Association of Military Studies and the former deputy commander uh, of ROK US Combined Forces Command. Dr. Sumi Terry, uh, the director of the Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy at the Wilson Center, uh, and Emma Chandler Avery, Specialist in Asian Affairs at the Congressional Research Service. So welcome all of you. Uh, we've got a little time here. We've got about uh, an hour and 20 minutes or so before we're gonna open up to questions. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll try and get each of you really to expound on, on the main question that I'm gonna ask. Uh, and, and Dr. Yoon, uh, Hyung Kwan, let, let me start with you. Uh, the key question I think that faces us is how is the North Korean threat changed? Uh, and in your opinion, what do we, all of us, need to be doing to address how the threat has changed over the last few months uh, and the last year? Uh, 
uh, as we all know, in 2019, April, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un declared that uh, his uh, policy will shift to hardline approach, strengthening uh, military capability and uh, trying economic rejuvenation by self-reliance. And probably uh, other panelists will focus on uh, military security dimension much, and I, I hope uh, they will uh, ex explain though that aspect eloquently. So I may uh, highlight the security implication of the, the latter part of Kim Jong-un's uh, hardline policy. That is his effort uh, to economic uh, rejuvenation by self-reliance. As we all know, economic sanctions led by the United Nations uh, and uh, border shutdown due to COVID-19 uh, directly it, I mean, affected North Korea's trade with outside world. And according to statistics, uh, their trade decreased uh, by 90%. 7% between 2017 and uh, 2020. And uh, the Bank of uh, Korea uh, statistics I mean, tells us that the uh, uh, North Korean economy has uh, decreased by 4.5% uh, annually uh, during the same time period. And their foreign uh, exchange income decreased by 90%. And furthermore, North Korea had a severe drought and the heat wave this spring, and uh, many are expecting that uh, they will have very poor uh, agricultural production this year. So they are facing a serious economic difficulties. Furthermore, uh, the rising uh, energy price and grain uh, and uh, uh, grain price uh, I mean, will uh, affect the economy I mean, negatively, uh, significantly. And uh, uh, at this time, uh, I mean, Russia and China cannot help North Korea much because as we know, uh, China is experiencing the uh, worst economic uh, situation this year in the last seven, uh, in the last uh, uh, few decades. And Russia is busy with uh, their own war in Ukraine. So I think all these factors uh, push it North Korea to a very difficult, unprecedented uh, economic crisis situation. And I think the North Korean residents are experiencing uh, on unusual difficulties, economic difficulties in their lives these days. And uh, certainly North Korea has shown some kind of resilience in facing this kind of economic uh, challenges in the past, but I'm not sure what will happen inside North Korea if the current economic crisis continues for, for two years or three years. I mean, we, we will, I mean, we, we have to pay attention to what happened in Sri Lanka and there may be more countries uh, which will experience that kind of economic difficulties in coming years. And nobody knows, I mean, uh, uh, whether North Korea will have similar experience or not, but uh, the potential security implication of the current North Korean economic situation is huge. And we need to pay attention to this aspect as well when we think of our security threat coming from North Korea. Thank you. General Vincent Brooks, uh, let me bring you in here uh, and, and just ask Dr. Yoon just mentioned Sri Lanka. I mean, we've all seen the, the photos, the videos of protesters taking over the president's palace or, or house, the prime minister's. So I suppose I, I should just quickly ask you whether you actually think that's possible. But as as Dr. Yoon suggested, you know, part of this is the military uh, and, and that's uh, between you and, and, and General Lim. So let me ask you first that question, that big overarching question uh, from your perspective, how has the threat from North Korea changed in the last few months and, and last year? And how do you think 
we, all of us, need to be addressing that change. Well, thanks a lot, Nick. And it's a delight to be with you and with the, the rest of this distinguished panel also. And congratulations to John Park on this third summit. Uh, you know, North Korea continues to demonstrate that it is modernizing in a number of different ways militarily. Uh, we've seen the increasing use of uh, short range ballistic missiles, many of which have a different type of flight trajectory than uh, traditional short range missiles or medium range missiles. They fly a lot flatter and are a bit more difficult to deal with. Uh, they still have the world's largest special operations force. They continue to use cyber operations and are one of the best in the world at that, not only for stealing currency around the world, which uh, has already been mentioned, but also in being able to conduct disruptive attacks using their, their cyber capabilities. Uh, we see them, as has been highlighted, conducting repetitive tests. Uh, these are both test and demonstration. So they're testing technologies, but also demonstrating that they have these technologies in a greater sense of maturity. Uh, it, it's evident that there's preparation for a, another nuclear test, the seventh nuclear test, and I'm sure we'll talk about that some more as we, we get into this. Whether they will or not is unknown, but uh, certainly it could be just a matter of time before they do. Uh, but the preparation is, I think, the key point here relative to your question of how has it changed. Let me, let me just also add, though, North Korea's conventional forces, in my estimation, continue to atrophy. Uh, it is infrequent that they conduct substantive military training exercises that can hone the combat edge. And so it's very clear that North Korea's investments are in what we refer to as asymmetric threats, things that are not force against force types of capabilities, things that can hold populations at risk or induce crises in governance in South Korea potentially in Japan, the United States, or the allies of the US. That's what we see really happening uh, with North Korea over the last several years. And as, uh, as Minister Yoon Young Gwan just said, they're hurting also. We, we need not ignore that and uh, view them as being invincible or 10 feet tall. Certainly they're not. They're in a very difficult circumstance. It, candidly, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine how they're able to sustain this rate of modernization under the current economic privation they experience. And so there's an inflection point out here. The final point that I would make is, uh, I, I think it's worthy of note that some of the measures that were introduced in 2018, especially, that were intended to lower tension have held, even as there's evidence of hardline stances by both South Korea, US uh, South Korea Alliance, as well as North Korea, but things like the reduction of some of the guard posts along the military demarcation line between North and South Korea, the relatively open area of the joint security area uh, and the reduction of weapons inside of there. Are they cheating? Hard to say. But the evident uh, aspect of it is that North Korea is still sticking by some of the agreements made in 2018, which to me says that they're not completely shut down on engagement if the conditions are right. What should we do then to answer the last part of your question? Uh, I, I believe that pressure has to continue and that pressure forms first in the strengthening of the Korea-US alliance. It's very clear that the two administrations are oriented that way. They've been absolutely uh, 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 clear and transparent about that as we go around the world. The fact that they're looking globally, not just regionally, is important. That's, that's pressure for North Korea as North Korea seeks to retain the attention of US and South Korea and the international community. But an outward look takes attention away from North Korea and puts them into a more difficult circumstance. Uh, at the same time, we must always, in my opinion, keep the door open for these small glimmers of hope when they emerge. If we're only looking for preservation of the condition of hostility, we will never see the opportunities when they flicker for uh, changing the direction of things. So I, I believe that has to also be part of the calculus. A pressure structure, an engagement structure, an outward look, and a very strong Korea-US alliance that is truly ironclad and getting stronger with every day. I think that's where we have to go. General Leem, uh, let me uh, 
propose a couple of points that General Brooks just, just suggested. One, from your perspective, is the US ROK alliance getting stronger? Uh, one of the tenets of what he said has to happen. Uh, and two, obviously talk about what we're seeing on the ground, uh, preparations for what seems to be the seventh uh, nuclear test and North Korea's recent announcement uh, about bolstering deterrence. You know, we all read uh, uh, that and, and have tried to interpret that. So from your perspective, how do you see these threats changing? Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor to be with you and participate the third Harvard uh, Belfort stamina. However, as you know, my East, my English is not good. Huh? <laughs> I read the translator who is the best translator in, the, in Korea, and I will speak in Korean now. Uh, 우선 여러분 다시 뵙게서 반갑고요. 저한테 말씀을 수, 얘기할 수 있는 기회를 주셔서 감사합니다. I'd like to start by saying thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet all of you here. Uh, some of you are familiar faces. Good to be here again. 시간이 많지 않기 때문에 지금 우리 셰프인 그 사회지께서 말씀하신 내용을 포함해서 간단히 말씀을 드리겠습니다. Uh, so I'll try to address all the points in as concise a manner as I can in the interest of time. 특별히 저는 또 군인이었기 때문에 군사적인 부분에 대해서 위주로 말씀을 드리겠습니다. Uh, I'll try to stick to the military side of things uh, since I myself was a former soldier. 아, 브루스 사령관께서도 말씀하셨지만 우선 북한의 군사적인 위협, 특히 핵과 관련한 그러한 능력과 또 미사일에 대한 능력은 어, 최근 1, 2년 사이에 굉장히 크게 그 능력이 커졌습니다. Uh, General Brooks pointed to this already, uh, but the military threat uh, from North Korea, especially as it pertains to its nuclear capability and missile capability, has increased quite significantly in the last year or two. Uh, so up until 2018, North Korea has conducted a total of six, six nuclear tests. Uh, now we're looking at a possible seventh. Um, in our estimate, uh, we believe North Korea is ready to launch the test whenever it wants to. Uh, all it has to do is press a button. Kim Jong-un은 지금 모든 준비를 맞춰놓고 여러 가지 상황을 고려하고 있을 것인데 특히 지금 북한 내부적으로 어, 이번 여름에도 굉장히 큰 장마가 있었다고 해요. 또 여러 가지 그런 상황들과 여건들은 그렇게 당장 오늘 내일 어, 핵실험을 하기에 좋은 조건은 아니지만 언제든지 북한은 가까운 시일 내에 핵실험을 할수 있는 준비를 맞추고 있다라고 우리는 판단하고 있습니다. Uh, so our estimate is that Kim Jong Un is ready to have the self test whenever he wants. Uh, it's just a question of when's a good time for him. Uh, he's probably taking multiple factors into consideration. For instance, there has been heavy raining uh, in North Korea this summer, uh, which is not a particularly conducive condition for having a significant test. Uh, so we believe he's ready to have the test whenever he wants. Uh, he's just looking for an appropriate time. 그리고 아시는 것처럼 올 들어가지고 북한은 열여덟 번의 미사일 시험을 했습니다. 여기에 모든 종류의 미사일을 다 보여줬어요. ICM부터 ILBM 극초음속 어, 발광 미사일, 단거리 미사일 모든 종류의 미사일 발사 시험을 다 했습니다. Uh, and as General Brooks also pointed to, and as you all know, uh, there has been in 18 missile counts, we have seen that North Korea has the full spectrum of different types of missiles you could talk about. It has the IR, IRBMs, uh, short range missiles, submarine launch missiles, uh, missiles with irregular flight patterns, and so forth. 
결국 북한은 한국뿐만이 아니라 일본, 미국까지를 포함하여 전 세계적인 위협을 가하고 있는 것입니다. In short, North Korea is presenting a threat not just for the Republic of Korea, but for Japan, for the United States, and for the rest of the world. 한국에서의 한국군과 우리 연합사령부는 이러한 것에 대한 우려를 굉장히 심하게 지금 하고 있습니다. And the ROC military and the combined forces command between the United States and the Republic of Korea are taking these military capabilities of North Korea. Uh, very seriously. 다행히 윤석열 정부가 들어서서 한미 간의 동맹이 좀더 강화되고 또 연합 훈련도 실질적으로 FTX를 포함하여 어, 제대로 하려는 분위기 형성되고 있기 때문에 이건 상당히 다행스러운 어, 분위기라고 생각합니다. Uh, so it's very it's an asset I very much welcome uh, the new commitment to strengthen the Korea US alliance um, under the present administration of President Moon Song Yeol. Um, I very much welcome uh, the fact that the atmosphere is shifting towards restoring some of the more substantial training between the Korean, uh, Korean and US military, uh, including field training exercises. Uh, uh, so in my estimate, uh, to respond to the changing threats from North Korea, uh, the Korea-US alliance has two tasks. Uh, the, ta the first task is to come up with something more concrete and specific uh, for the concept of extended and tailored deterrence that we have. We have the concept. Uh, it needs to be fleshed out. Uh, number two, uh, we also need to flesh out the concept of the 4D uh, counter-missile operation. Uh, counter -missile operation. Uh, and we have to train for it. Uh, so that's what I have to offer. Thank you. Dr. Sumi Terry, if I could uh, have you zoom us out uh, a little bit again. Uh, so we've gone through uh, the perspective of, of the military. We've also heard the, the idea that Sri Lanka's economic situation is so bad it, it could become Sri Lanka. Uh, perhaps you could, you could respond to that. Uh, and, and the overall question that I'm asking to frame the whole conversation you know, how do you see the threat changing um, uh, over the last few months and, and the last year? So Professor Yoon gave an overview of dire economic situation that the North is facing and security implications of that. I'm not sure if it's gonna to get to Sri Lanka stage, but it's, there's no question that North Korea is going through severe internal problems, food shortages and dire economic situation. General Brooks talked about the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear missile program as well as cyber threat and other threats. And General Lim just gave a great overview of the North's nuclear missile threat. Um, the, the, you know, the bottom line is despite these um, enormous economic difficulties uh, that the North is facing that Professor Yoon just talked about, this year alone, and General Lim just gave an excellent layout, uh, the North tested uh, 18 times, launched 33 missiles, including ICBMs. Kim Jong-un also tested new missile technologies, uh, such as train-mounted ballistic missile, new surface-to-air defense missile system, uh, long-range strategic cruise, cruise missile, hypersonic missiles. Why? It's, this is all in an effort to perfect its own missile and deterrent capabilities, to diversify its missile arsenal, and to really defeat American missile defenses. So what we have today is, to, you know, is the North Korea that has amassed up to 60 nuclear warheads, some say 30, some say 40, the exact number doesn't matter. Um, it is producing enough fissile material to make half dozen new bombs annually. A 2021 RAND Corporation um, they had a report uh, that projected that North Korea could have around 200 nuclear weapons and hundreds of ballistic missiles uh, stockpiled by 2027. 
And available evidence also suggests that the North can miniaturize these warheads to fit a top uh, missile. And Kim Jong-un is now likely moving uh, to the next phase, uh, which is placing multiple warheads on a single ICBM. And this MERV capability will, is again designed to frustrate uh, limited, you know, to frustrate U.S. missile defenses and to really enhance North Korea's ability to strike the U.S. mainland with nuclear missiles, making North Korea just one of the three countries in the world, uh, along with Russia and China, to possess this dangerous capability. So that is the threat that we are facing. And all indications are that North, uh, the North is technically prepared for another nuclear test, as General Lin just talked about. Uh, Pungeri, which was dismantled in 2018, uh, restarted uh, the restoration activities restarted on uh, March 28th. Again, again, it's preparing for another test, possibly next generation tactical nuclear weapon. So given the situation, what do we do about it? I mean, I hope we get to discuss it more robustly, but we do need to keep up the pressure. And at the most basic level, we do need to strengthen our regional deterrence and defense capabilities and military readiness. And of course, this you know, includes enhancing theater missile defense system around the Korean Peninsula, um, introducing more advanced uh, air and naval assets into the region, um, you know, developing and deploying more sophisticated U.S. and South Korean strike capabilities and all of that. And again, reinforcing Washington's extended deterrence, um, robust military U.S. rock joint exercises that were scaled back during tr the Trump era. So, um, you know, we don't have a magic solution to the North Korean problem, uh, but the crisis that we're facing is very serious. Emma Channel, Avery, I, I wonder, obviously, what, what we just heard from Dr. Sumi Terry is, is um, uh, shall we say, the, the kind of stark assessment when it comes to North Korea capacity, both what it could do soon in terms of its nuclear test, but missile test, uh, missile uh, capacity um, and, and diversification and the reasons thereof. Uh, are, are absolutely laid out there. Uh, I wonder if, if that's how, how, how you see it, uh, how, how the threat has emerged, uh, and also how you see those little glimmers, as, as General Brooks uh, suggested, uh, that, that the idea for diplomacy has not been totally shut down. Thank you, Nick. And um, let me uh, echo the other panelists and thanking John and thanking the Belfort Center for inviting me. Um, I also need to say I work for Congressional Research Service. We work solely for Congress, so we take no positions on any piece of legislation um, or any policies um, by the administration. Um, so with that said, I will try to be mildly interesting um, in any <laughs> comments that I offer here. Um, I mean, I think that the other panelists going before me have done a good job of laying out how um, the threat from North Korea has emerged, how their capabilities have certainly improved. Um, you know, we're consumed with a lot of other things in the world, but um, with Korea, despite being under very harsh sanctions, despite basically blocking their border um, in response to COVID has still been able to plot along and, and demonstrate um, their advanced capabilities. They're still producing missile material. They still have chem and bio weapons. I mean, um, that is still there, even if we're mostly talking about Russia and Ukraine and Taiwan and, and China. Um, and sometimes I think that those conversations um, you know, may distract us, but I don't think that they're distracting um, Pyongyang while we're having these. Um, in terms of, of diplomatic paths, um, I mean, it's, it seems fairly um, dire, the possibility of engaging directly with North Korea right now. I and mean, we are well past the era of, of love letters um, between the United States and the DPRK. Um, but I do think um, that um, the attention to alliances um, from the Biden administration is, is with an eye to um, enhancing our, our deterrent capabilities. Um, I, I wanna mention that I think that there have been some, some, some little indications um, of, of, of South Korea and Japan, or maybe even more than little um, glimmers in the last uh, just couple days of South Korea and Japan wanting to um, mend relations in some way and, and work together, particularly on uh, security cooperation. Um, 
if North Korea, as, as other panels have said, does decide to test um, a seventh nuclear weapon, um, those are the sorts of, of provocations that tend to drive closer trilateral cooperation um, among the US, Japan, and South Korea. Um, we just saw in the last couple of days, um, Foreign Minister Hayashi and Foreign Minister Park um, meet and, and try to begin to um, uh, resolve some of the really thorny um, um, historical issues that have divided these two countries um, for some time and, and specific mentions of getting um, the GSOMIA, the information sharing agreement, uh, more normalized, more functioning, sharing information. Um, I think there's hope that South Korea and Japan would go back to doing some um, uh, tracking, uh, missile tracking exercises together. Um, and we saw the defense ministers meet with Defense Minister Austin as well and Shangri-La to begin these conversations. Um, I, you know, you tend to be um, pessimistic um, about the ability of, of Japan and South Korea to, to work together, but I think I'm cautiously optimistic or, you know, just waveringly pessimistic or whatever the inverse of that would be. Um, to um, see that begin. And that's because um, the threat from North Korea has increased. Um, President Yoon has indicated he would like to mend this relationship. And Japan also is in a very different situation now. Japan is, um, you know, not only is there, of course, um, Japan is well within the range of, of, of North Korean missiles. They are deeply, deeply concerned about, about China um, and its military modernization and, and assertiveness in the Senkaku Islands and elsewhere. And now they're on Russia's bad list as well. <laughs> so they're sort of surrounded by um, these, these threats and feeling less secure, which may be one of the impetus, the impetus that they need um, to get on the right page um, with South Korea. So I hope that we get to the point where we were before um and even beyond and having you know it would be it would be to our advantage i think um to or observers might say um that it would be to the our advantage the u.s advantage if we got to doing extended deterrence dialogues trilaterally for example um where where there was a really a united front uh, um there so um, I'll stop there, um, but I think that that building that sort of strength and that sort of unity um, in in uh, confronting North Korea is the best uh, way of creating pressure um, on the regime to eventually get back to some sort of diplomacy. Thank and, you. And, and note, Emma's uh, observers might say so. Just just to reiterate, she's not. Uh... Uh, positing her own opinion, but it's a very informed point, obviously. Uh, and Dr. Yoon, if I could start this next round about what we should be doing about these increased threats. Uh, all, all five of you laid out uh, forms of pressure, keeping uh, diplomatic ideas open, even if the, the light, uh, to use General Brooks's metaphor, is, is flickering not very, not very brightly. Uh, but then this point about the U.S. ROK alliance, but also regional efforts. So, so talk about that. H how important is this mm -hmm. momentum when it comes to Japan uh, and and the ROK? And and how do you see any kind of regional architecture uh, advancing in order to deter North Korea, given the tensions or given the relationship? I'll just leave it there between Beijing and Washington. Thank you. Uh... But before I talk about trilateral cooperation uh, among the United States and ROK and Japan, uh, I'd like to add uh, a short comment uh, on diplom diplomatic efforts that we need to uh, do in coming uh, years. I think um, uh, uh, considering ever increasing uh, military threat coming from North Korea, it is important to strengthen extended deterrence to confront the kind of uh, security threat. Uh, and I think it was very appropriate for both leaders in the last US ROK summit to agree on strengthening uh, extended deterrence mechanism. But I think extended deterrence is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. As we all, as we all know, 
Uh, in the past history, there are many examples of inadvertent uh, words caused by misperceptions and misunderstandings or uh, overreactions, etc. So uh, as tension heightens uh, on the Korean Peninsula, I think there will be rising uh, possibility of that kind of uh, escalation. So uh, there should be some kind of economic initiatives uh, taken by the US and ROK, I think. For example, I'd like to recommend uh, for the uh, I mean, uh, Biden administration dispatching a high level special envoy to Pyongyang. He or she may be I mean, not necessarily be from the public sector, if uh, he or she is uh, respected by the American public and close to uh, uh, President Biden and his team, it will be fine. The job of the special envoy would be exploring a possibility of resumption of dialogues and sending uh, a message that uh, the United States and ROK are serious about resuming talks. Uh, there are at least two important benefits of doing this kind of diplomatic gesture. First, facing another crisis situation in Korea uh, would be the last thing that uh, Biden administration would want, uh, which is busy with handling the war in Ukraine and uh, I mean, uh, competition with China and uh, domestic economic problems. So trying to build a de-escalation mechanism uh, through or, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, dispatching uh, an envoy uh, would be a reasonable effort for a preventive uh, diplomacy. And also, as I already mentioned, the economic uh, situation of North Korea is dire and economic issues are deeply related to their security policies. And this kind of situation, difficult situation, provides uh, more room for diplomacy compared to the past time. So we need to try to utilize this kind of uh, I mean, uh, more room open to us. And uh, I, I know that uh, I mean, uh, a kind of pessimistic mood is prevailing inside Beltway. Uh, but I hope uh, the Biden administration's policy toward North Korea not solely be based on the, that kind of pessimism. In terms of uh, trilateral uh, cooperation, I think we can uh, benefit uh, much in various uh, areas. For example, we can confront North Korean security threat uh, more effectively through closer cooperation between Japan and ROK. And we also can benefit uh, in terms of achieving the goal of uh, 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 global uh, I mean, the supply chain uh, resilience in this time, of, in this time uh, when uh, economic security matters much. And also those three countries will be able to defend a democracy and rule-based international order more effectively. So I would like to recommend, I mean, uh, for those three governments to re-establish some kind of uh, organizational framework like a TCOC, I mean, Trilateral Coordination Oversight uh, Group. And I think that organization uh, was a very useful uh, framework for trilateral cooperation uh, some time ago. Thank you. One of the moderator's prerogatives is, is to jump around a little bit and to highlight possible differences among our panelists. And so if I could jump to Dr. Sumi Terry and, and ask you to take on those, those first um, uh, uh, points um, that, that, that we just heard from Dr. Yoon, um, that while we talk about deterrence because of the threats that we've been discussing, there also should be economic incentives provided to North Korea uh, and also uh, the announcement of a special envoy. But what Dr. Yoon's point was is that some kind of reassurance to North Korea that the envoy would provide. Do you think that, that those steps would be wise? You're trying to get me to debate, uh, <laughs> Professor Yoon. Uh, deeply respect and, you know, um, I'm not against the idea of envoy or trying to do what we can to engage with the North. Um, 
you know, so I, I don't disagree with him. Um, I am more skeptical. So I'm one of them on the more skeptical side. He said, you know, he hoped that Washington, we're not too pessimistic in Washington. I think I would like to phrase it as more realistic rather than pessimistic. I certainly think we need to leave the door open to diplomacy and have envoy and send a strong signal to North Korea that, you know, that, yeah, while we remain resolute in the face of North Korean provocations, um, you know, we're not afraid to talk to Pyongyang, that we are, we're doing what we can. Um, but I am not, I'm just not, you know, sure we can try to do that, but it's, you know, the Biden administration said that we're ready to talk to North Koreans anytime, any place. Um, we didn't have any kind of precondition. It's the North Koreans that they are not yet willing to talk to us. So I'm not sure even if we um, appoint an envoy, whether they are at this point um, ready to talk to us. I think they will as, at some point in the future, but I think they have a certain timeline and that timeline is something we talked about earlier, uh, you know, with all the testing, they're trying to get their technical capability to another level before they return to the talks um, to increase their leverage when they return to the talks. So sure we can, um, I think we need to have a human rights envoy. I think we can have certainly an uh, envoy to, for, for this level of talks. I'm just not optimistic in North Koreans at this point where um, is, is ready. I, I just think they just have their own timeline and that's different from ours. Forgive my attempt to, to get the debate uh, going, but I, I appreciate that. Um, so, so let me go back to actually a point that, that Dr. Sumiteri made before and, and turn back to General Brooks uh, and talk about what, what the solutions are and, and what extended deterrence is. So um, Sue so was taking, uh, made a few points. We have to increase military readiness. We have to deploy more advanced assets uh, and, and more strike capabilities. So take that on. Is, is that something that you think uh, is wise right now and put it in the context of what uh, Emma was, was saying before of, hey, there's this possibility uh, of, of more cooperation with Japan. How important is that from your perspective? Well, clearly extended deterrence is a, a, a fundamental part of the alliance system, not just the alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States. And in my view, it is, it's, based on a sense of trust and belief that if something were to happen, then the resources, the full resources of the United States could be brought to bear. Uh, it's a difficult one to demonstrate though, because many of the assets are kept hidden and the allies have to rely on essentially a promise. So any efforts that can reinforce confidence between allies, that could be a visitation to some of the capabilities that deliver the nuclear portion of extended deterrence. And oh, by the way, we shouldn't think extended deterrence automatically equals use of nuclear weapons. It doesn't. And uh, as the uh, post-summit statement, joint statement that uh, happened just uh, 14 days after President Yoon suk yeol came into office and President Biden visited him in Seoul, uh, it's the full array of capabilities. So all the things we've talked about are part of extended deterrence in my way of thinking. What are we talking about? Exercises, demonstration of capability, strengthening the alliance, engaging in cooperation in areas beyond defense, enhancing the readiness of forces on the peninsula and bringing visitation of forces not on the peninsula, like the ongoing F-35 joint exercises that are happening between US F-35 aircraft and South Korean F-35 aircraft, continued modernization of the South Korean armed forces and the US armed forces on the Korean peninsula so that the capabilities that North Korea is demonstrating become less and less effective at holding the alliance at risk. And certainly that's what they're doing, but then there's a degree of escalation that happens in this and I acknowledge that. But I believe that the US and South Korea are far more technologically advanced and they're certainly more economically solvent uh, and they have much more room to be able to create a harder and harder target for North Korea. And this opens the door in my view toward dialogue. So this is extended deterrence in action, in day-to-day -day practice. And it leads to the condition where North Korea realizes they really just don't have any good uh, options that will move them into a future that they can live with if they 
pursue only a threatening posture, that there has to be some dialogue. And what I'm looking for is how, do, how does the alliance get to a deeper level of dialogue with North Korea if the door does open to really address what the deepest security concerns are of North Korea? It, it's, it's not, in my view, some of the superficial things that are talked about, forces on the Korean Peninsula, the, the presence of strategic assets, as they're called by North Korea. There's more to it than that. And, and if we can't get to a deeper level, uh, then there can't really be progress. Now, on the trilateral aspect of it, I, I believe that uh, this is an opportunity. North Korea can help to stimulate trilateral cooperation. And so does China, for that matter. They stimulate trilateral cooperation. And it's a good time for that with the change of administration, uh, really three administrations in US, Japan, and South Korea over the last two years that creates a new environment for going in a direction that I think all three countries want to go in, but have had difficulty in moving for domestic political reasons in each case. Uh, but we have to be realistic about it. Assume you use the term realism, and I absolutely agree with realistic opportunism. I join the two of those together. There is an opportunity here to enhance cooperation. I think we should be realistic, though, about envisioning some sort of you know, Northeast Asian alliance that has all three countries in the same alliance structure with uh, mutual defense treaties. That's, that's a step beyond where I think reality is at the present. That could emerge in years to come, but that is certainly not the start point. Uh, you, you mentioned things like the General Security of Military Information Agreement, the GSOMIA, a very important conduit for the direct sharing of information between Japan and South Korea. You know, if you imagine a, a equilateral triangle that has only two sides connected and one left open, how strong is it when pressure is put on it? It's, the answer is not very strong. It goes flat very quickly. But if you can join the, the last two points that are not connected, and that is Korea and Japan, then you have a much stronger circumstance. Cooperation is the first level. And if, as we see increased cooperation ongoing, that moves against North Korea's interests. And candidly, uh, in, on a broader sense, it moves against China's interests and Russia's interests, which uh, both include dismantling of the alliance system, or at least weakening it and fracturing the connections between the US and South Korea, the US and Japan. This is what I think is, is, is afoot here. General Lim, if I could ask you to respond to those, those points that General Brooks made about Japan, he said, this is a new environment, but there's obviously limitations. So how, how do you see the cooperation, the trilateral cooperation, and how important is it, and how far can it extend? Yeah, uh, so I believe that all of our national leaders and military leaders recognize the importance of having an alliance system in place uh, between the Republic of Korea, the United States and Japan considering all of the threats that we'll face in the future, which is not limited to North Korea, but also includes China and others. Uh, so the question is, if all of the leaders recognize the importance of an alliance, of a three-way alliance, why is it so difficult to work towards it? Well, as many of you already know, uh, there is a considerable amount of historical baggage that makes that process very difficult. Uh, and that baggage exists between the Republic of Korea and Japan, of course. Uh, therefore, if we want to see enhanced cooperation between 
uh, enhanced trilateral cooperation uh, and improved military cooperation that's trilateral, you need an improvement of, you, you could say that the key is to improve the bilateral relationship between Korea and Japan. 자, 그런데 여러분들 이것을 한번 이해하셔야 됩니다. 대한민국이란 나라가 지난 70년 동안 엄청 노력을 해서 군사적으로 세계에서 5위 내지 6위의 군사력을 보유하고 있고 경제적으로도 세계 10위 정도의 강국이라고 하는데 이러한 국력을 가지고 유럽이나 중동 같은 데가 있으면 아주 굉장히 강난 국가이겠죠. 그러나 이 동북아 지역에서는 대한민국이 군, 어, 국력적으로 꼴찌라는 겁니다. Uh, now, there's something that I think everybody should bear in mind. Over the last 70 years, the Republic of Korea worked very hard uh, to become a stronger country, essentially. Uh, now, analysts say that it has somewhere between the fifth and sixth largest military force in the world. Uh, is the, somewhere around the 10th largest economy in the world. That's considerable. Uh, and if you place it in any other region throughout the world, South Korea would be a very powerful country. In the context of where we are located in Northeast Asia, we're not the most powerful force in this region. And this isn't a new trend either. Over the last 5,000 years, it has been a recurring theme for Korea that we have always been surrounded by nations and forces that are much more powerful than ours. Uh, and we have been under threat uh, posed by those actors uh, that surround us. Uh, and the most recent iteration of that uh, just happens to be the modern history and the associated baggage that we have with Japan. Uh, so what's important or what's critical to setting the conditions for a trilateral relationship uh, is resolving some of these uh, some, some of these very old uh, tensions between the people of two countries uh, that has been held for geopolitical reasons for a very long historical time frame. 근데 불행하게도 지난 몇년 동안 한국과 일본의 지도, 지도자들은 이러한 한일 관계를 국내 정치적으로 이용해 가지고 한일 관계를 최악으로 악화시키는 결과를 낳게 했습니다. Uh, and, the, and some of these concerns are deep-seated concerns that reside within the populace. So it's not just a single person's mind you're trying to change. You're trying to change the, you're trying to resolve the concerns of an entire people. Uh, unfortunately, over the last number of years, senior leaders, both Korean and Japanese, have tried to use these sentiments uh, for short-term opportunistic political maneuvers, which has brought our bilateral relationship uh, to the lowest possible point you could have imagined. 지소미아 사태가 좋은 예였고요. 그러나 다행히 한국과 일본의 새로운 정부들은 이러한 한국과 일본의 관계를 개선하기 위해서 노력하겠다 하는 것을 대내외적으로 천명했습니다. 이것이 하나 앞으로의 기회가 될수 있을 것이라고 생각합니다. Uh, so the role so the row over Jusamia just happens to be one example of how political expedience was prioritized over a commitment uh, to resolving those deep-seated concerns so that we can have the necessary uh, cooperation. Very fortunately, uh, the leader, the incumbent leaders have both internally and externally uh, expressed their commitment to improving the relationship between Korea and Japan. And I think that presents a new opportunity for us. 아, 불행하게도 최근 아베 총리의 그 죽음에 한국의 종교 단체가 또이 연관이 되어 있는 그러한 보도가 나오고 있어서 좀 걱정스러운 부분도 있지만 앞으로 한국과 일본의 
새로운 그러한 관계가 형성될 가능성이 크고 그러한 것은 어, 단계적으로 진행이 돼 나가야 된다라고 저는 생각합니다. Um, I very much greeted the recent news of the death of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, with great concern. Uh, it was very tragic news. Uh, and I was very concerned about uh, some of the coverage, news coverage that uh, implied a potential connection to a religious group based in Korea. Uh, and I had concerns for how, what that might imply for the next, uh, for, for the next turn in Korean Japanese relations. Uh, but that notwithstanding, in several other substan substantive aspects, I believe that uh, opportunities, significant opportunities have presented themselves for improving relations between Korea and Japan. Uh, and I think it's important to take up these opportunities and to move step by step. Uh, we have to work towards the end goal we want. Uh, and obviously, we won't be able to do that all in one fell sweep, all in one fell sweep. But we have to work towards it step by step. Uh, so, uh, 결론적으로 마지막으로 말씀드리고 싶은 것은 분위기를 조성하기 위해서 첫 번째는 한국과 일본의 그 정부의 정상회담이라든가 이런 걸 통해서 분위기를 조성하고 두 번째로 쉬운 교류, 문화적인 또한 그 양국 국민의 관광 이런 걸 통해서 어떤 그 문화적인 교류를 통한 분위기를 형성하고 마지막 단계에서 북한의 핵이나 미사일 위협을 어, 그런 상황을 우리가 이용을 해서 한미일 군사적인 협력 관계로 나아가는 이러한 그 프로세스를 가지고 점진적으로 다시 발전시켜 나가는 것이 한미일 동맹을 강화시키는 방법이다 이렇게 생각합니다. 감사합니다. Uh, so I'll close with what I think that step-by-step -step process would look like. Uh, number one, you have to create an atmosphere in which it's susceptible for the people of both countries uh, that we're going to have cooperative talks. Uh, and to do that, you can start with the lowest hanging fruits, which would be cultural exchange, uh, sending tours to each country, uh, to each other's country. Start with the low hanging fruits uh, and eventually use the very present uh, security concerns presented by North Korea's nuclear missile capabilities uh, to have substantive security talks, uh, uh, which will help build towards uh, the more lasting alliance system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sumi Terry, I know you, you wanted to, to jump in on, on trilateral cooperation. Um, we've heard from General Leem talking about a new opportunity, General Brooks calling it a new environment. And, and we just heard General Leem suggest starting with culture, cultural exchanges might, might work best. Uh, how do you see it? Uh, no, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, General Brooks talked about having realistic expectation when it comes to the bilateral relationship, and I agree with that. Um, you know, I worry that even with President Yoon saying he wants to repair the bilateral relationship, you know, I'm concerned that there might be a gap between the reality, the rhetoric and the reality. Um, uh, but, you know, I just wanted to point out this, you know, with Prime Minister Abe's assassination, um, you know, just, just shocking assassination, deeply, deeply shocking event. I, I wonder, you know, I, that that it would further undermine, um, this event will further undermine Japanese confidence uh, that, that, you know, their country, right, um, that, that, you know, that it can continue to be a safe and peaceful place that it has been since World War II, you know. Um, the, you know, the Japanese have been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change, you know, Chinese uh, behavior, this rising fears about potential conflict in Taiwan Strait, North Korea's uh, expanding WMD program that we just talked about, disarray in the United States, right? Russia's in invasion of Ukraine and the downward, um, relationship between Russia and Japan since then. And then this shocking incident of uh, assassination of Prime Minister Abe, um, it's all, all of this is bound to make Japanese more concerned about its security environment. Um, but I want to just point, I bring this out because I think, you know, when you look back at history, it's precisely these moments when Japan and Korea's relationship, um, when they were concerned about security, there were, there were actual opportunities for cooperation. And I just want to just point out, for example, in 1998, when President Kim Dae-jung went to Japan and there's Kim and 
Prime Minister Obuchi declared there was Kim Obuchi declaration, their intent to improve their relationship, Korea-Japan relationship through political, societal, economic, and cultural exchanges. And what led to that declaration? You know, there were motivating factors on both sides. Um, leading up to that, there was a security crisis the year before, there was North Korea's uh, nuclear, uh, the missile test that 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 Japan was concerned about its security. Uh, there was also a financial crisis, IMF financial crisis, in 1997. So these, the, my my point, I guess, is that history suggests that it is possible uh, for this very low point of Korea-Japan relationship could yield to um, another period of increased cooperation in light of increased security. Uh, um, concerns. Um, and then if there's a right leadership, I think that's another key. So we'll see. I'm very mindful of what General Brooks said about having a realistic expectation, particularly when it comes to this bilateral relationship. But I just bring the point this out as we'll see if this is potentially an opportunity for Korea and Japan's bilateral relationship and trilateral relationship with the United States. Emma Chandler Avery, uh, you rightly brought us to trilateral cooperation, so I'll let you respond uh, to, to what we've been talking about, uh, but also help us zoom out even further uh, and talk about China. W what should we know about uh, uh, what China, as far as we can tell, is, is thinking when it comes to North Korea, acting towards North Korea, and also, you know, you know the administration's policy on Indo Pacific and, and the relationship with Beijing, how does that fit into uh, this regional architecture really, even if even if it's just Japan are okay that we're talking about this regional architecture that that I think we're we're we're, we're heading toward, or at least we're we're envisioning a little bit. Um, thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks for bringing us to to expand the aperture a little bit on looking at the region. Um, and, and first, I do want to say, you know. No one's talking about a trilateral alliance, <laughs> um, a treaty alliance. Like that is cruising for a bruising, as my mom would say. Um, mm -hmm. But getting on better footing, I think, um, is in everyone's interest. Um, we could also talk, I can talk at, at, uh, at great length about uh, Abe's assassination, how this may or may not affect um, relations on the Korean Peninsula. But for a second, let me just talk about um, Yoon's emphasis on Korea being a more global player and how that might fit in with this. Um, Yoon has you know, done things like, I think he was the first prime minister ever to go to the NATO summit. Um, he joined um, the uh, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, and he has, has indicated that he's interested in cooperating with the Quad, uh, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue among the US, Japan, India, and Australia. Um, and I think that there's real opportunity there, um, particularly if the Quad's activities aren't seen as um, sort of in direct hard security um, areas um, and, and, and things that, that China would respond particularly poorly to. Um, you know, you can see vaccine partnerships um, or um, working on climate issues as among those areas that um, South Korea has uh, a lot to offer um, regionally and would be the kind of things that would not um, directly offend Beijing quite as much as some of the other areas. Um, so I do hope that um, um, that that that's going to be examined um, as, as part of the portfolio of becoming a more global player um, and, and more of a regional player and more engaged in the regional architecture. Um, I think that the Quad has been emphasized um, by the Biden administration as one of the centerpieces of how it will engage with the region. Um, and that, that it's hard for South Korea to engage with the Quad's activities um, without getting on a better footing with Japan um, because Japan was one of the, of the founding members um, of the Quad. Um, the um, other area that I, wanted to mention was that, um, just to go back for just a second to Japan, Korea, um, keep in mind that, that Kishida was the foreign minister who negotiated um, the Comfort Women Agreement in 2015. And despite the fate of that uh, particular agreement, um, he was, I think, um, seen as engaging in um, productive ways um, with South Korea. Um, um, despite what may have happened politically um, to the, the foundation that was founded for that. 
Um, so I hope that we could sort of expand and talk about um, South Korea's involvement with the rest of the region. They have made efforts, um, even Moon Jae-in made a very high profile visit to Australia um, to try and work on that relationship. Um, so I think that, that, that there is some fertile ground um, for South Korea to, to engage beyond the peninsula uh, with the region. So Dr. Yoon, why don't you take that? Uh, so so uh, as Emma points out, we have seen the Yoon administration uh, state publicly, one of its policies is, is to be a global player. Um, do you see that as a good thing? And, and do you see that as, as different or, or advancing the work that you were doing? Uh, and, and bring us back to Beijing as well. I, I'll go back to that. You know, how, how do you see what China is and isn't doing, whether it's helpful or not? Let me answer your uh, second question first in terms of uh, the role of China. I'm somewhat skeptical about that uh, because if we look back the recent history of three decades actually, since the beginning uh, of the North Korean nuclear crisis, China's role on uh, denuclearizing North Korea was not that much helpful. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, they tended to regard uh, nuclear issue uh, I mean, as a matter just between the United States and North Korea. And in 2000s, uh, China uh, tended to uh, take the role of uh, uh, third party mediator between the United States and, and, and North Korea when they hosted uh, I mean, uh, six party talks. In the 2010s, when North Korea began to accumulate their nuclear stockpile, I mean, they were rather quick in accepting uh, I mean, North Korea as a nuclear state uh, I mean, and uh, regarded uh, that kind of uh, I mean, uh, happening as a fait accompli. And nowadays, they began to veto I mean, US-led efforts to impose additional sanction against North Korea. So I think it's time for the US government to devise a new, a fresh approach to North Korea. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the Biden administration uh, will be able to do that or not. But I think uh, to fix the problem of North Korea nuclear problem, I think we need a new approach uh, considering that kind of changing situation. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, that can happen, I think the United States will be able to achieve the goal of denuclearization and uh, taking a uh, more advantageous uh, position in competition with China uh, in theory, uh, but I don't know whether that will be possible or not. What I'm saying is uh, making North Korea as uh, a kind of Vietnam in Northeast Asia. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, uh, North, uh, Vietnam uh, was a kind of hostile country uh, fought with the uh, United States uh, and uh, it became a kind of partner uh, and uh, helped the U US foreign policy in checking uh, China in one way or another. Uh, so, I mean, it's a kind of theoretical answer, but I don't know whether that kind of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, solution can be found in the in near future because it would be very difficult to shift uh, American uh, paradigms on this nuclear issue uh, and toward that direction, considering the current political mood inside of Washington, D.C. In terms of uh, South Korea taking the, uh, I mean, uh, more uh, active uh, role in global uh, community, for example, becoming a pivotal state, I think it is very desirable, uh, actually. Uh, I think uh, the uh, war in Ukraine and uh, the election of President Trump in 2000 uh, were the two most important uh, I mean, uh, political events that uh, reminded uh, South Korean people of the importance uh, of the value factor in Korea's diplomacy. And I think uh, election of President Yoon and resetting South Korea's diplomacy uh, towards strengthening bilateral alliance with the United States 
uh, was in some sense a response to these new developments and uh, changing South Korean perception. And I was uh, happy to read uh, I mean, uh, the contents of the joint statement of both leaders this May. And I, I sincerely hope that South Korea can become, I mean, can achieve that kind of goal of becoming a pivotal state in global affairs and uh, be able to, I hope uh, South Korea uh, be able to provide um, international public goods in global community uh, further. Uh, so I think that's a good direction. I, uh, even though, I mean, the uh, North Korean security threat is huge for South Koreans, uh, we need to uh, uh, broaden our diplomatic perspective uh, as a kind of uh, I mean, uh, advanced country, I mean, 10th biggest economy in the world. Thank you. General Brooks, mo moderator's prerogative here, and I'm gonna uh, ha have you respond to an administration policy. Uh, obviously you can, you can decline to, to judge it, but G General Yoon, uh, sorry, um, uh, Dr. Yoon just, just called for a new fresh approach uh, from the US. Uh, the US, has left the door open to diplomacy, uh, as you suggested. Uh, Jake Sullivan, when he gave some remarks a few months ago, I'm sure we all saw, said that, that the new approach was somewhere between strategic patience and, and the grand bargain. Uh, and I think he, he used incremental approach, I think is the phrase uh, that, that he suggested, uh, providing partial compensation, perhaps sanctions relief in exchange for partial uh, dismantlement. I think that was the point. Uh, so, so take that on. You know, you, you brought up diplomacy, the importance of, of keeping that door open. Uh, is the current administration's approach sufficient? Well, it's never sufficient until you achieve success, but uh, it, it's clear that it's not the same as what has been seen in the last two administrations or the ones before that. There will always be some degrees of continuity. I mean, we're dealing with the same same part, the same world, and, and uh, the same challenges within that world, and uh, with new ones having been added. But I, I, I do believe this idea. I'll, I'll refer to it as strategic deliberateness of knowing where it is you want to go, and not foreclosing any road that leads to it, and yet trying to create pressures so that there are choices made to go down the ones that are most likely to be productive. Uh, so we have to be, I think the administrations have to be very careful in balancing this idea of keeping the door open without conditions and yet not reinforcing negative behaviors to the extent where it's simply pocketed by North Korea as it has been done so many times. There are plenty of reasons to be pessimistic about trying to move forward with North Korea. But to find that very thin road that leads to one of those flickering lights that I alluded to before is much more challenging. And so that requires thinking about it differently, assessing it constantly, and in, in my personal opinion, trying to change the point of view from which we look at the problem set. For example, are we looking at it from the eyes of the alliance? Or are we looking at it, trying to look at it from the eyes of North Korea? Difficult to understand, it's, they're so opaque, it's difficult to really know what they're thinking. But what is it that we're really contemplating? Are we seeing where North Korea views itself relative to China? Are they satisfied at having China control their economy in such a way that they've been left a basket case for decades? Is that something North Korea wants to have endure? Do we think that they're an ally of China if that's the case? If we change the point of view as we look at the problem, we may find that there are new things to be considered that we haven't contemplated before. And I, I think fundamentally centering on what is deeply in North Korea's interest, economic security, for example, may be one of those. Security of the regime clearly is another one as well. But I don't know if it's going to be continued reliance on China. So does the approach then require a tactical approach toward North Korea that keeps the door open without reinforcing negative behaviors? while coupled with a larger view of the geopolitical realities that are out there and how they might change if North Korea changes. That, that's something I believe is worthy of the consideration of this administration. It, it is uh, just after 6.30. Um, uh, we've got 12 more minutes uh, to, to finish this round. Uh, and then uh, John's gonna 
going to jump in uh, and, and do uh, some moderated questions and answers. So please, everyone, think about your questions uh, now and, and submit them as you think of them into the Q&A. And I see there's actually already a couple. Um, but General Lean, let, let me come to you with, with that fascinating uh, point that General Brooks just made. If, if we think of it from not the Alliance perspective, but from North Korea's perspective, uh, and he talked about providing economic security options, regime security options. I, I wonder how you see that, uh, wh whether that is an approach uh, that you could see uh, bearing fruit. Just give me one moment. Yeah, yeah. I'll go. 좋은 말씀입니다. 브루스 장군하고는 2021년 7월에 같이 Foreign Affairs의 Grand Bargain이라는 그 그런 기구한 적도 있는데요. 어, 북한이라는 그 사회를 여러분들이 잘 이해하셔야 됩니다. Uh, it's a uh, wonderful it's point a... and a fascinating point indeed. Uh, as you all know, General Brooks and I worked on writing an article about the Grand Bargain, so-called Grand Bargain, uh, in 2021. Uh, submitted to foreign affairs. Um, so as we discuss this point, I think it's important for us to understand the society that is North Korea. Uh, so I personally have spent 40 years of my life uh, confronting North Koreans along the military demarcation line. Uh, uh, and in every case, we were looking at each other. In, we were confronting 그러면서, each other. Uh, 사회를 많은 그러한 국제정치 학자들이나 또는 이러한 전문가들이 사회주의적 관점이나 공산주의적 관점에서 들여다보고 있는데 이것은 아주 대단히 잘못된 관점입니다. Uh, so, I can say I had my fair share of dealing with uh, the people, the characters uh, that are from North Korea. I've noticed that a lot of academics and expert analysts uh, often try to look at North Korea through the lens of uh, socialist society or communist society. They try to analyze North Korea as a socialist society. And I think that is uh, the wrong footing on, on which to understand North Korea. 북한은 전 세계에서 유일하게 존재하는 왕조 국가입니다. Uh, because I think the truth is North Korea is the only true feudal state, that, uh, true, true monarchy that still exists today. 북한 주민들은 왕조 이외의 사회를 경험해 보지 못했어요. Uh, the North Korean population has never experienced anything other than a monarchy. 생각해 보십시오. 1910년까지 북한은 조선이라는 왕조에 속해 있었고 1945년까지는 그 왕조의 자리를 일본 천황이 대신해 왔고 해방된 이후에는 공산주의가 들어온 것처럼 보이지만 김일성, 김정일, 김정은으로 연결되는 백두혈통으로 불리는 또 왕조 시대가 계속되고 있는 겁니다. Uh, because up until 1910, uh, the people in North Korea have experienced the monarchical state called Joseon. Uh, and then until 1945, the monarch whose control they were under uh, was the Japanese emperor. Uh, and then after the liberation, uh, they say they brought in communism, but what they really brought in was a monarchy uh, that continued from Kim Il-sung down to Kim Jong-il. Down to Kim Jong Un. 그러한 관점으로 보아야 김일성, 김정일, 김정은으로 정권이 세습되는 걸 이해할 수 있는 것이고, 그 다음에 지금 김정은과 북한 순회부가 하는 행동을 이해할 수 있는 것입니다. Uh, and only by looking at North Korea as a monarchy can you understand the political environment in which it was possible and it did actually happen. Uh, it did actually manifest. Uh, wherein Kim Il-sung handed over his leadership to his son, who handed over his leadership to his son again. 
Um, and only by considering North Korea as a monarchy can you understand the decision making process that it has demonstrated so far. 이 왕조 국가의 특징은 자기네들의 왕조를 이루는 소수의 핵심적인 권력의 유지의 모든 그러한 그 목적을 걸지 일반 대중들의 삶과 대중들의 그러한 그 발전 사회적 발전 이런 것에는 크게 관심이 없습니다. And uh, the characteristic of a monarchical state is that the survival of the state is uh, the survival of the state is equal to the survival of the regime. Uh, all the state's resources go into maintaining control for that particular monarchical line. Uh, the lives of its population are not as important a concern. This is our history of Korea, but Joseon is a country of the Korean people. Joseon's king is the king of the Korean people. Um, we can see a similar pattern in the, the, the previous chapter in our country's history, uh, in which even as Joseon was on his path to, uh, on, uh, was in its decline, it maintained its survival for a period by uh, collaborating with the monarchy of Japan. 그래서 북한과 어떤 대화를 하든 협력을 하든 북한을 어, 자유주의 형편으로 돌리던 어떠한 모든 그러한 정책을 수립하는 데 있어서는 이러한 북한의 왕조가 무엇을 원하고 무엇을 두려워하고 어, 이들이 어떠한 생각을 가지고 있는가 하는 그러한 관점에서 쳐다보아야지 우리와 또는 일반적인 그러한 국제관계에서의 관계로 북한을 쳐다보면 그리고 거기에 대한 대응을 마련하면 항상 실패할 수밖에 없다. 저는 이렇게 생각합니다. Uh, so as we consider options for how we can engage North Korea in dialogue or whether we want to somehow bring it in uh, to the rules-based liberal international order, what we have to bear in mind is that we have to talk to them as if they are a monarchy, uh, assuming that they have the fears of a monarchical state uh, and the desires of a monarchical state. Uh, if we try to base our dialogue on anything else, say a very modern sense of ideological commitment rather than a concern with preserving the monarchical line, uh, our approaches will likely fail. 단계적으로 왕조가 원하는 것을 주되 그 사회를 근본적으로 변화시켜서 자유 민주주의와 인권 이러한 개념이 그 사회 속에 어, 스며들게 해서 궁극적으로는 레지임 체인지를 달성해서 북한을 아까 우리 위원관 장관님도 말씀하셨지만 자유 진영과 동맹의 편에 서게 하는 것 이것이 궁극적 목적이 되어야 된다고 생각합니다. 감사합니다. Uh, so I'll conclude by saying that our end goal is to bring North Korea into the fold of the liberal international order. Uh, but to do that, uh, we can't convince the monarchy to change its mind. Uh, so as a matter of strategy, tactics, we have to give some of what the monarchy wants while allowing the population uh, to acquire the values that are conducive to transforming that society uh, to one that is willing to become a member to the liberal and national order. Thank you. Uh, keep the questions coming in, everyone. Um, uh, we only have uh, four or five minutes. I've, I've tried to time this perfectly, but obviously uh, uh, we're running out. So I will pull back here. Sumi Terry, just, just respond to that in a couple of minutes, if you will, uh, providing the monarchy some of, of what it wants. Uh, the monarchy? Uh, can I just expand out? I mean, the monarchy, I mean, of course, North Korea um, is one of the most unique state in this still monarchical Confucian, you know, hereditary communist dynasty in a very unique um, state. But I wonder if I could just spend my last few remaining remarks, just talk, talk a little bit about just the um, larger, you know, I didn't get to mention about the China, the intensifying US-China competition and the war in Ukraine. Um, and just all that, you know, having such a profound implications for the region uh, globally, and of course in the region, but on, on the North Korea challenge. And here, I think there are two challenges. 
Uh, first, we didn't get to really talk about this, but I do think that it's undeniable that for North Korea, the Ukraine war had really underscored, and it goes back to what everybody else was talking about, but really underscored the importance of nuclear weapons for its security. I mean, they already had that, they, they already got that lesson um, from Iraq and you know, seeing Saddam Hussein and from Libya and Gaddafi. Um, so it's not like they were gonna even give, give up nuclear weapons. But again, I think this really underscored it for North Koreans. So, you know, they know that Russia would not maybe unlikely to have initiated the war if Ukraine had not given up its nuclear weapons um, through the Budapest Agreement in 1994. Uh, and so, again, it's sort of that's the lesson we already, you know, I was already pessimistic, but I, I wanted to underscore that point. Again, Iraq, Libya, and now um, the Ukraine. But the second challenge here I want to also quickly point out is, is um, you know, this in addition to the intensifying US-China competition and Ukraine, um, we are, you know, I, I think post-Ukraine, North Korea is actually uh, in a favorable, is facing a favorable external environment in being able to also continue developing its nuclear missile program. And here's my point about China, you know, this US-China competition, and then now Putin and Xi Jinping's really uneasy alliance all of that has further complicated our efforts to make progress on North Korea. You know, we, we talked briefly about how China is extremely unhelpful. You know, there were times when Beijing and Moscow were willing to join forces with the United States and its allies. Not often, but there were times, um, you know, when they were helping with, in terms of sanctions front. I'm thinking of the fall of 2017 in particular during the maximum pressure campaign. Um, but now with US-China competition and the Ukraine war and Putin-Xi alliance, we're not gonna get any help from these guys. You saw at the United Nations Security Council, they vetoed, you know, um, you know, they couldn't even condemn an ICBM launch, first of all, and they were veto against any, um, any actions on, on North Korea. So even when there's a nuclear test in this situation, given this situation, even an additional nuclear test by North Korea is unlikely to put from any kind of serious action from China or Russia. So I, I think this is just one other thing that we need to be aware of. And I think it's gonna you know, pose a challenge to us. Emma Chandler Lavery, uh, last comments from you um, in, in the time we have before John starts a Q&A. Uh, take it away, but, but you know, as, as Sumitari just, just mentioned her perspective, it's more complicated now that Russia and China have, um, you know, the, the no limits uh, alliance, I think, as, as the, uh, their phrase was right before the Olympics slash the invasion, uh, but also you, North Korea seen Ukraine as a lesson of why they need nuclear weapons? Um, I'll be brief. I mean, that's a huge question to ask at the very end of the session. Um, I mean, I think that, um, I, I mean, I absolutely um, take Sumi's point. I mean, that that they've learned that nuclear weapons are, you know, sort of a, a security guarantee for them. Um, but I also think that, um, that China and Russia, despite sort of being seen as partners, um, I think there's limits to how far that can go. Um, I mean, China has certainly seemed to thrown its lot in with Russia here right now, but they've done so in a way that at so far they've, they've avoided, you know, sanctions specifically for that support. Um, and I think that the whole region is, is sort of, taking notes on what this all means, you know, um, and particularly in applying it to how this um, affects the, the cross strait situation in China and Taiwan. I mean, Japan was certainly jolted by this and, 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 and really sees that there's a parallel. Um, but, you know, I think for China, this didn't go as, 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 as smoothly as they may have thought it was going to for Russia. Um, so maybe they're, um, you know, taking a pause too on thinking about um, um, their situation with Taiwan. So I think it's way too early to tell where this all shakes out. Um, but I also think that um, China, it probably doesn't like the fact that alliances have proved like that in this case, the cross the, um, the transatlantic alliance has, has stood as firmly as it has and as united as it has at least so far. Um, and that's probably a little bit of a, of a warning um, to Beijing as well. 
So I'll stop there because there's just way too much to discuss um, in, in talking about all of the regional players in the world. So sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, so for, for, for the last uh, uh, bit, uh, we've got our, our question and answers. Please keep them coming via Q&A or, or email. And, and for that, uh, I turn it back over to, to John. Nick, thank you so much. Uh, great uh, effort there in drawing out some fascinating nuances and insights from the panel discussion. Uh, we'll transition now to the Q&A portion. Uh, and to start off, Stephen Ellis asks, how does Japan's increased military buildup affect future security cooperation with the ROK? Uh, if I, I could start with General Brooks. Uh, well, thanks, John. And uh, thanks, Nick, uh, for, for moderating for us. Japan is carefully assessing its security needs, and it must do that in the context of continuing threats, some of which are becoming more significant, some Chinese aggressive behaviors, the concerns about cross-strait pressures between China and Taiwan that have implications directly to Japanese security, and the continuing uh, hostage-holding of the Kuril Islands by Russia. So what they may have hoped, Japan may have hoped to have had a secure northern flank at some point in time is not secure. And certainly in between the two sits North Korea. And so Japan has to be mindful of what does it take to secure Japanese territory, Japanese citizens. Having said that, any buildup of capability that would include considerations of retaliatory strike capability, precision strike at long distance from Japan into North Korea. I'll just use that as an example, since North Korea is very directly threatening Japan, has implications for South Korea. So these are the types of things that North Korea knows first, uh, how to create irritation in the alliance system. And it's on matters like these. Japan's buildup has to be done with a mind toward the balancing of these these uh, these disparate issues and pressures throughout the region, and much less their need to to see beyond uh, the their own archipelago down into uh, Southeast Asia, into Oceania, and across into the Indian Ocean. Japan has interest in all of those as well to sustain themselves economically. That I think will be the kind of framing that goes through there. Dialogue is going to be really important. This is why that. That base of the trilateral uh, is so is so important. The di, the 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 bilateral relationship between South Korea and Japan must be predicated upon these, and they have to have very serious conversations about it, so as to not scare or threaten one another unintentionally. Thank you, and and with that, Emma, we do see this effort with the new UN administration putting a lot of early effort in terms of connecting with Tokyo and advancing this type of bilateral. Tokyo Seoul uh, security cooperation. Uh, and so with this, uh, you know, as we see Stephen's question here, how, how are you viewing it? And if I were to look at Stephen's question from another angle as well, we see two alliances playing out. You have the US Rock Alliance and the US Japan Alliance. US Rock Alliance is focusing more attention in terms of activities related to the threat coming from North Korea, very focused on the Korean Peninsula. And then you have the US Japan Alliance that is uh, a key pillar of the Quad uh, going farther afield uh, in the Indo-Pacific. How are you seeing the two alliances play out in that respect, uh, where there are, there are some areas of differences where the focus and the efforts are clearly one regional and one Korean peninsular? Um, thanks for the question. Um, well, I think first, just to look at the, at the context here, um, I think that both uh, particularly the U.S. Rock Alliance, but um, also the U.S. Japan Alliance, um, are a little bit bruised um, from their experience um, with the Trump administration, just because there was an open sort of skepticism of the value of alliances, um, and I mean, particularly the burden sharing, um, you know, negotiations with South Korea um, were really difficult for the alliance to maintain, and it's not a new dynamic. I mean. Those are tough negotiations. Both, you know, it's 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 very uh, sort of central that that these alliances are going to fear abandonment um, by the U.S. at some point. Um, I think that that there's been an emphasis on these alliances under the Biden administration, um, but it was a reminder that these are delicate, <laughs> um, and there's at least a perception 
of the relative decline of US power in the region. Um, so I think that both of these countries are, you know, hedging a bit. I mean, looking to develop um, at least some degree of, of autonomy um, in their ability to defend themselves. So I think an arms race has been underway for some time and it may accelerate. Um, I think Japan is certainly looking into to new capabilities and looking at the capabilities um, that would have been taboo to talk about, you know, a, a decade ago. Um, there's a momentum now because of Abe's assassination to try and and um, secure some of the you know the elements of of, of his uh, more muscular posture as as part of a legacy. Um, but South Korea is doing this too. South Korea is developing some really advanced capabilities, um, really building up their indigenous defense industry. Um, so I think that everyone is doing this, which is why if we can get to some degree of of trust and information sharing where there's not just instant skepticism um, and threat um, from, from, one, from South Korea or Japan building up these capabilities, um, then that's a, that can be at least mitigate against instability in the region um, and, and distrust. So I think it's a, it's a, there's a window, um, but it's, it's not, it could close quickly um, if, if um, you know, Japan, for example, moves quickly to, to revise Article 9 of its constitution. I can't imagine that being received particularly well um, in, in South Korea. And for the record, I mean, it takes a long time to do that. This is not happening tomorrow, um, but I do think there will be, it, it sort of has a new um, new lease on life um, in the aftermath of, of Abe's death. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks for that, Emma. Uh, before going to General Lim and Dr. Yoon, looking at the relationship between Russia-Ukraine conflict and the China-Taiwan potential uh, conflict there, I wanted to turn to Sue. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Samuel Wells, who asks, what are the possibilities of the ROK reducing its economic engagement with China in order to expand global cooperation with the US and if possible with Japan as well? Sorry, I think this is a fundamentally um, the key question that South Korea is grappling with. Um, I think that effort has already begun, but you know, as you know, South Korea's um, trade relationship with China, the, their trade volume is just double that of South Korea, US, South Korea, Japan combined, and that is the reality of it. But since the you know, that deployment and China's economic you know, coercion and retaliation to South Korea, and I think given the South Korean public perception towards China also has been negatively uh, trending. I mean, it's their view of public perception of China is right now even worse than South Korea's per public perception of Japan. So South Korean leaders are aware of this um, and they are trying to sort of diversify. I don't know how in reality, how far they can really um, pull away from that. But I do think this is a key long-term question for South Korea. Um, going forward and you know whether you call it a hedging strategy or a balancing strategy they've been pursuing this strategy for a very long time president yoon has now promised to be tougher on china um, now they have to contend with a public opinion that is very different that has soured on china but we'll see again you know I, here i wonder you know whether the reality again you know we talked earlier about whether we're talking about bilateral relationship with japan general brooks said you know the sort of the expect you know we need to have a sort of tempered expectation of how much things can go um so again even on china i don't know how in reality how much they can really do that given the the economic situation. But I do think this is a key question for South Koreans to have to answer for themselves. I think we're going to be revisiting that question for uh, years to come. Thank you for that, Sue. Uh, and now turning, uh, starting off with uh, General Lim, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Yoon on the same question. This is from Gentin Christo, and he asks, how does the posturing of the US and NATO against both Russia with respect to the Ukraine conflict and China with respect to Taiwan influence the situation on the Korean Peninsula? Starting with, with you, General Lee. Yes, thank you for the question. As I said, Ukraine is connected to the Ukraine I think that 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, John earlier mentioned uh, that there's a certain amount of connection between uh, China as it pertains to Taiwan and what's happening right now in Ukraine. Uh, so I'd like to extend that discussion a little uh, more in answering this question. 군사적인 관점과 군사 전략적 차원에서 말씀을 드리겠습니다. As I'll speak in terms of the military perspective and military strategy. 만약에 시진핑이 대만에 대한 군사적 충돌, 뭐 대만을 침략한다든가 하는 상황이 생겼을 때 시진핑이 가장 걱정하는 것은 무엇일까요? Uh, so the question for us is, what is Xi Jinping's greatest concern if he is considering a potential invasion of Taiwan or otherwise planning some kind of military conflict with Taiwan? What would be his biggest concern? It's most likely going to be the involvement of the United States. And Xi Jinping will factor that into his calculus. 그런데 미국 본토에서부터 대만까지 뭐 해군이나 공군 지원하는 것도 그렇고 특히 육상에 있는 부대가 간다는 건 굉장히 어려울 거예요. Uh, so speaking in terms of the military, uh, it's going to take a while for naval or air assets to depart from the United States and reach Taiwan. And it's going to be even more difficult to deploy land forces all the way there. 만약 미군이, 미국이 대만 사태에 군사적 개입을 하겠다고 결정을 하면 군 지휘부에 있는 지도자들은 한국과 일본에 있는 주한 미군과 주일 미군을 그쪽으로 전용시키고자 할, 어, 전용시키는 것을 원할 겁니다. Uh, so if the United States does, if China does decide to do something about Taiwan and project its forces there, and if the United States decides to respond to it uh, through a military intervention, uh, the leadership will likely have to consider moving the forces stationed in Korea and Japan and deploy them into Taiwan rather than bringing them all the way from the continent to the United States. 그것이 시진핑에게는 또 가장 큰 위협이 될 겁니다. Uh, so the forces deploying out of Korea and Japan will likely be the greatest concern for Xi Jinping should he choose to do something. 그러면 시진핑은 한국에 있는 2만 8천 명의 주한 미군과 이를 지원하는 3만 8, 5만, 4만 5천여 명의 주일 미군이 대만으로 전환되지 않도록 하는 그러한 전략을 피, 필려고 할 것입니다. So if that's Xi Jinping's greatest problem, uh, then what is his strategy answering that problem? Uh, well, it's likely going to be doing what he needs to do to prevent uh, the deployment of the forces, uh, 28,000 US forces and 45,000 US forces in Korea and Japan, respectively. And he has to fix them. Then. 그렇게 하기에 가장 좋은 것은 또 김정은이가 많이 원하는 김정은을 통해서 한반도에서의 군사적 크고 작은 충돌 상황이 발생하게 됐을 경우에 주한 미군이나 또 이것을 지원하는 주일 미군이 그쪽으로 전용되기가 상당히 어려울 것입니다. Uh, so the best way to do that would be to uh, fix those forces again where they are located or prevent them from deploying to Taiwan. Uh, of course, uh, Kim Jong-un will want uh, those forces to be absent from the region uh, so that they cannot be involved in conflicts whether small or large in the Korean Peninsula. 이렇게 되면 또 미국은 한반도에서의 군사적 충돌에 대한 대응과 대문에, 대만에서의 대응을 동시에 하게 되죠. 굉장히 어려운 상황에 처하게 될 겁니다. Uh, so one scenario in which China and North Korea both get what they want is uh, one in which a simultaneous military conflict in Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula forces the United States to split its forces uh, and present it with multiple fronts. 그런데 이 한반도에서의 상황은 대만이나 우크라이나하고 상황이 틀립니다. 우리는 휴전선 지역에 약 150만의 병력이 집결되어 있고 여기서 튀는 불꽃이 
얼마만큼의 확정과 확대를 하게 될지 아무도 몰라요. Uh, now one might think that the desired effect can be accomplished by just creating a small minor military situation in the Korean Peninsula to present additional complications for the U.S. forces as it, as it, try, as it tries to deal with a greater situation in Taiwan. But you have to bear in mind, there is 1.1 million forces concentrated around the military demarcation line in the Korean Peninsula. There is no minor spark in the Korean Peninsula. It will likely, uh, it, it will likely escalate very quickly. 그래서 저는 군사적으로 대만 사태와 한반도의 사태가 어떤 지렛대 양쪽처럼 같이 이 지역에서 발생할 가능성이 높다. 시진핑이 만약에 대만에서의 군사적 결시, 어, 행동을 하기로 결심을 한다면 따라서 한미 동맹은 여기에 대해서도 충분한 대비를 해 나가야 된다라고 생각합니다. 이상입니다. Uh, so to conclude, uh, if something happens in Taiwan, it will likely mean a significant situation here in the Korean Peninsula as well, which means the Korea-U.S. alliance has to be prepared for a simultaneous event in Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula. Thanks very much. And, and uh, before going to General Brooks on a THAAD question that came in, uh, the same question that we looked at here from uh, Jenting Christo, I'd like to pose uh, to Dr. Yan. So just to recap, how does the posturing of US and NATO against both Russia on the Ukraine conflict and China on Taiwan influence the situation on the Korean Peninsula? Thank you. Uh, let me make my answer uh, brief. First, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as I already mentioned, reminded South Koreans of the importance of values such as uh, democracy and rule-based international order. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, they I mean, uh, began to recognize that uh, uh, South Korea as a democratic country and uh, as a country which benefited from uh, internet, uh, liberal international order so much, uh, should try to I mean, uh, take an important role in keeping and maintaining uh, this kind of liberal international uh, order. So I think that's the reason why South Korean government is, uh, government is participating in, 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 in uh, providing uh, and support and aid to Ukraine uh, these days. And the, my second point is, as already as as uh, Dr. Terry already mentioned, uh, North Korea will uh, become more. Uh, I mean, more. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, eager to to uh, develop their nuclear program as the result of uh, Ukrainian war, and that will uh, make the challenge of denuclearizing North Korea even more difficult. So uh, that's uh, uh, one important uh, impact. And finally, uh, many South Koreans uh, tend to think that uh, the U US government, the Biden administration may be too busy with so many urgent international and domestic issues. Ukrainian war, competition, competition with China, and Iran and domestic uh, economic difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. So they may be concerned about uh, whether the Biden administration will have uh, much I mean, uh, energy and time uh, to focus on South Korean uh, situation if something happens. Uh, so that's why I uh, emphasize the importance of are taking some kind of diplomatic initiative. Uh, I mean, the international situation surrounding uh, South, Korean, uh, South Korea is uh, developing toward a negative direction uh, nowadays. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, General Brooks, this is a question that comes in from William Mitchell, who's a graduate student here at Harvard. And, and he asks, with the advancement in North Korean missile capabilities, uh, there appears to be the need for more robust missile defenses. 
but China has reacted negatively to the deployment of systems like THAAD in South Korea. How can the ROC-US alliance enhance defense capabilities without straining relations with China? Well, thanks for the question. I, I begin with a, a few things. First, I, I believe that China overplayed its hand with regard to THAAD. Uh, they overreacted on the perception that they had, perhaps through their own military advice, that the deployment of THAAD, a defensive system, would pose some sort of threat to Chinese interests and security. That was a miscalculation that caused Xi Jinping to go out too far over his skis until he could make it to his, his, uh, his, his plenum. Uh, having said that, the principles behind the deployment of THAAD were ones that I believe are relevant to any enhancement now. The first is it must be done to protect the Republic of Korea and concurrently uh, any other allies who are threatened by North Korean systems, including the homeland of the United States. So it's about defending first. Uh, the second principle is it's about the alliance deciding for its own sake what is needed to create that defensive array. The third is uh, to think of the purpose being to disable the ability of North Korea to hold at risk alliance population centers and key resources and facilities, which they use for deterrence purposes. You know, this idea of we would never think about engaging in combat operations with North Korea because Seoul would be struck. So as people automatically finish that sentence, it's an affirmation of the deterrent value that North Korea has in being able to threaten the populated areas of Seoul. So the, the purposes of these uh, uh, missile defense enhancements, and I would add counter cruise missile, counter unmanned aerial system, counter rocket, counter artillery, counter mortar, uh, the combination of those things that threaten the populated areas are the purpose. It's to take away the ability for North Korea to use it for deterrent purposes. Now, there are some specific tactical things, and I, I won't go too long on this because it, there, there are many, but the first begins with integrating the existing systems in a way that they are smarter with regard to one another and an incoming threat, and that they're more distributed and layered. That's a, that's a bit of a term of art, but you don't want a single shield that's protecting, you want multiple layers of shield that would protect you from a given incoming threat. And that's done through integration, South Korean and US integration and integration among the very systems themselves. Positioning into the right spots is also important. And candidly, given the sophistication of South Korea and the United States, especially when they work together, developing the solutions that are unique to Korea would be very, very important. They're sophisticated enough to create a unique defensive system there that uh, can enhance the protections as well as uh, decrease the deterrent value that North Korea derives. Thank you. And with that, you know, the technical analysis that General Brooks presented, Emma, to you, uh, the same question related to THAAD and how uh, South Korea uh, and the ROC Alliance navigates this, but also addressing legitimate concerns uh, regarding these uh, quick advancements. Uh, and added to that, uh, Emma, if you could also address uh, economic coercion question. Uh, very briefly, we saw in that, that episode, China applying an economic coercion playbook different from the U.S. sanctions playbook, essentially uh, shutting off access to the Chinese marketplace uh, and uh, an immediate effect as well. So, uh, Emma, to you, uh, first, that, that question of how the U.S. ROC alliance can navigate uh, this thorny issue in relations to China and then the economic coercion piece. Well, um, obviously, um, General Brooks laid this out um, quite well in terms of, of, of the technical need for it. Um, I would just say that, that the THAAD episode, um, I think that I've heard many analysts say that there was a sense in South Korea that the United States um, didn't do enough to, to, to protect South Korea or to come to um, uh, to help them, um, given the tremendous economic losses um, that South Korean companies faced um, because of Beijing's sort of unofficial boycott. Um, so I wonder if there's um, a room to talk about whether, and then probably our South Korean colleagues could address this the best, um, you know, some sort of mechanism where the United States um, 
guarantees that there would be um, you know, some sort of, of, of economic assistance. Um, if there was a similar episode with another um, you know, thad type um, battery and, and, if, and if China had a similar reaction, I'm wondering if that's sort of within the realm of, of, of alliance cooperation and would that be reassuring? Thank you. And uh, to that question, uh, if I could turn to you. Uh, so, Dr. Yun, with this, uh, this was an experience that very much is alive in South Korean memory uh, when China practiced this version of economic coercion, almost like economic disciplining in the sense that it wasn't uh, an implementation of sanctions or getting other countries to apply uh, sanctions as China saw them, but a clear, a subtle, and below the surface type of uh, market restriction measures that are hard to find the concrete evidence for in terms of bringing these uh, kind of cases to the WTO and so forth. Uh, how do you see uh, China's economic coercion in this space playing out going forward? And how potentially might the UN administration respond to that? I think the Chinese government's policy of sanctioning uh, South Korean companies uh, a few years ago was a kind of uh, mistaken approach uh, from a long-term perspective. I think uh, Chinese sanction against South Korean companies uh, marked on a watershed in terms of South Korean people's perception on China. Uh, it uh, deteriorated, uh, deteriorated uh, rapidly. I mean, uh, South Korean people's perception of China uh, became very negative after that I mean, sanction. So I think uh, chi chi the Chinese government had better think twice if uh, I mean, it wants to I mean, impose similar uh, sanctions in South Korea and also in other countries too. Uh, that will strengthen their isolation in international society. And uh, on the issue of what we should do, I mean, uh, Alliance, the United States and other uh, countries can do on this uh, uh, economic sanction issue is a matter which is not, uh, I mean, uh, restrict, I mean, which, not, which is not a kind of a bilateral issue only, but also a, a matter of a US global strategy. I think uh, the US government, the Biden administration uh, needs to pay attention to this matter and probably try to build a kind of a multilateral, uh, I mean, uh, kind of uh, organization or agreements uh, uh, with which they can help each other when similar things happen in the future. So I think uh, it's a kind of, uh, I mean, global strategy. Uh, I mean, which may, I mean, boost, I mean, the position of uh, US as the leader of liberal international order in the future, if they can establish a kind of multilateral mechanism uh, to, to handle this uh, sanction issue. Thank you. Uh, certainly a lot of opportunities to explore that because uh, we are uh, likely to see a recurrence of that uh, in, the, in the region as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Yun. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Sue and, and question Sue here related to, uh, as we touched on briefly in the panel discussion, as, as uh, Nick, Nick was facilitating this uh, pathway to negotiations. Sue, from your vantage point, uh, when it comes to efforts to try to re-engage with North Korea to get them in a negotiated settlement to give up their nuclear weapons, what role, what kinds of economic incentives do you think would, would help as a catalyst to get that going? So John, as you know, I, I, I'm someone who thinks that if we need to give, a, the North Korea is not going to give up basically nuclear weapons for economic incentives, right? Um, so I think economic incentives is not gonna be enough. And I don't know what kind of package that we can offer um, to entice him to give up nuclear weapons. I think President Trump, that he could entice Kim to uh, with sort of Vietnam style economic development. Uh, his expectation, as we all know, did not bear out, which was not a surprise because in Vietnam's case, you know, adopting Chinese style economic policies and development, this was all possible um, after the installation of reformist leaders who, who turned toward um, liberalizing and expanding their economy. 
after unification, after their dream of unifying all of Vietnam under their rule occurred. This is a very difficult, different um, situation with North Korea. Um, so th we continue to have very difficult task of trying to convince Kim with any kind of economic in incentives to give up, to abandon the nuclear arsenal that keeps his own regime safe and to basically open up his country uh, while this freer rival state South Korea exists. So I think for me, you know, from, you know, I continue to assess that economic incentives to, to get them to give up nuclear weapons for economic incentives, I think this is a very tall task. Thank you for that. And, and so, you know, certainly the, the challenge seems to grow, but, uh, you know, efforts still continue in trying to find and negotiate a way through this uh, this is something that uh, I think a lot of folks will continue to observe very closely. So I do think we can get to manage the crisis. I do think we can get to an interim deal. I think we can reduce the threat. I'm just saying to get the North Koreans to give up nuclear weapons. You know, I don't think I don't think that we're willing to make that trade. Is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the final round here, and I'll pose one question to all the members uh, as we wrap up. Uh, and as we get to this point, and, and we've uh, teased out a lot of the nuances here. And my questions, uh, my question to each of you uh, is related to what you see as the near term, the immediate opportunity that particularly the US ROC Alliance can seize in terms of advancing, enhancing uh, security uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we've had a, a very rich discussion here, but if you were to pick one particular immediate within grasp type of opportunity that we should focus on, uh, what would that be? Starting with General Lim. Sorting out. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think I what the, the Korea US alliance can do right now is resume robust military training. I think that's an immediate task to accomplish. Uh, I think it's actually a very important task that we need to accomplish. Uh, we need to ensure that the U.S. forces stationed in Korea have adequate conditions in which they can train uh, up to standard uh, and in which there is value to the U.S. forces being stationed in Korea because they are constantly training. Uh, and by doing so, we need to ensure that we constantly improve our readiness. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. And the same question to Emma. Well, I'm going to continue my theme of uh, trilateralism, <laughs> um, and I think that if we can get to, um, you know, not just back to where we were five years ago, um, but even enhance um, the cooperative security cooperation among the U.S., South Korea, and Japan, I think that would go a long way towards um, demonstrating that we can sort out some of these differences, at least keep some of the history issues um, that, that divide Seoul and Tokyo on a separate track and work together. Um, I think we may have that opportunity if North Korea does indeed conduct um, a seventh nuclear test. Um, but I guess the, the thing to look out for most immediately, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we're expecting in the next month or two um, that uh, uh, decision about whether or not to um, liquefy the assets that were seized um, from Japanese companies. I think that's, that's I think Tokyo is, is very keenly paying attention to that. Um, and if we can uh, find a way um, through those, through that decision and, and cooperate, um, I think that will go a long way towards demonstrating that the U.S. Is, has demonstrating leadership in the region and South Korean solar are, are, are showing they can get past it as well. Great. Another very important perspective to add. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, over to you, Sue. 
is it to me? Sorry. Um, I agree with everything, um, you know, what we heard so far. So I think, you know, until North Korea is interested um, in returning to talks, we need to continue to increase pressure. Um, you know, and even if UNSC does not act because they're not going to act, um, we might have to act unilaterally on the sanctions front. And then we need to increase pressure by enhancing deterrence. Uh, as I talked about before, robust US rock joint exercises, and then bolstering uh, trilateral intelligence um, capabilities. Um, and, you know, um, more robust exercises also including Japan, if that's possible. Um, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily think you know any of pressure uh, would get North Korea to give up nuclear weapons, whatnot. But I think only way for us to get to negotiation is to just go through this crisis. And even, they are trying to test um, and and perfect their capabilities so that they can increase their leverage when they do return to dialogue. So we need to keep up the pressure. So when we return to dialogue, that we can actually have some sort of. Um, um, an agreement and, to, and for us to increase our um, leverage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Yun. Uh, yes, uh, um, I think um, I was, uh, and many uh, South Koreans were reassured when both uh, President Biden and President Yoon sang yeol agreed on strengthening uh, I mean, uh, uh, extended deterrence mechanism in their uh, joint statement uh, last May. I think that's uh, very important. Uh, that's the right thing for both leaders to do when we uh, consider uh, uh, North Korea's ever increasing uh, military threat and increasing their capability, uh, 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 increasing capability of North Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, that's very important. And that should be the basis of alliance relationship uh, in coming years. But as uh, I already mentioned, uh, that's a kind of necessary condition rather than sufficient condition. So we need to consider what kind of diplomatic opportunities there will be. And I, I, I hope uh, I mean the Biden administration uh, take some kind of initiative uh, uh, first rather than waiting for North Korea uh, does something. Uh, and that's why I recommended uh, I mean, the idea uh, of uh, dispatching a special envoy to North Korea. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, pessimism uh, is uh, uh, I mean, prevailing uh, inside uh, Washington DC and in Seoul, uh, but I think uh, all the situation, especially the dire economic situation in North Korea, maybe providing some kind of uh, I mean, uh, wider room for diplomacy than we usually uh, think. So taking some kind of diplomatic initiative that will open uh, the opportunity for uh, progress in, uh, on this important issue. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yim, for keeping the spotlight on the importance of uh, diplomacy negotiations there. Uh, and finally, to General Brooks for the, uh, the final uh, remarks to the uh, question of uh, which immediate short-term priority that the U.S. ROC Alliance can seize in advancing security on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, thanks very much. And again, it was a privilege to be part of this. I, I, I will echo some of the comments that have been made and then maybe add a little bit of an additional twist on it. I, I do believe that creating an alliance that is stronger that is harder uh, to threaten, to defeat, that is broader in terms of its reach and uh, its uh, categories of cooperation and, and uh, extensive linkages. I think that all these things create an alliance that is uh, more able to take risk with regard to negotiation. So the stronger you are, the more resilient you are, the more risk you can take with regard to negotiations. Therefore, there's a duality that I think is necessary here. North Korea understands this duality 
of things. They certainly demonstrate duality in most of what they do. Uh, they, they clearly are a two-sided coin. The Alliance must do the same thing. So while getting stronger in all these other characteristics that I just talked about, being non-threatening to North Korea and making it very clear that dialogue is what we seek. And it's a deep dialogue about the things that North Korea, North Korea really needs. These are the immediate actions. Get stronger, get harder, get better, and be ready to take risk when North Korea ultimately decides to move in that direction. They control the pace of dialogue. And that's absolutely clear. It's been the case for a very long time. But the, the alliance must be in the right posture to be seen by North Korea as this is one that we really don't have a choice but to have a conversation with. And it's not, as someone described to me during the difficult times of 2017 and 18, North Korea must retain the opportunity to come to the table with its hand out, not its hand up. And if that can be done, then uh, I think we might find ourselves with an opportunity. Well, General Brooks, uh, Emma, General Lim, Dr. Terry, Dr. Yoon, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for panel one. Uh, clearly with uh, clear eyes and full hearts, uh, created a lot of momentum, uh, drawing on a number of complex issues, but bringing a type, a type of clarity to it that uh, provides great foundation as we build for panels two and three in the coming days. Thank you so much again for joining. With that, uh, also like to uh, thank uh, Nick Schifrin again for moderating panel one. Uh, we'll now move to our wrap up session. Uh, today's panel highlighted all of these efforts uh, as we see in terms of the parallel path uh, related to bolstering defense uh, deterrence, the capabilities on that front, as well as trying to keep the avenues for negotiations and diplomacy open. Uh, and so with that, we'll continue to monitor these uh, types of activities. In the future, the Creo project will be sponsoring a number of events uh, on these threads to uh, build out further. For day two uh, for the summit, as we continue tomorrow, we'll be focusing on building mutual prosperity through resilient technology supply chains. Dr. Francesco Giovannini, the Executive Director of Managing the Atom Project at Harvard's Belfer Center, will be moderating a truly outstanding panel and continuing with this theme of, of excellent speakers. Uh, we have on that panel the Honorable Dr. Theo Park, former ROK Minister of Trade and President of the Lee & Co. Global Commerce Institute. We also have Ambassador Mark Lippert, Executive Vice President and Head of US Public Affairs, as well as Chief Risk Officer at Samsung Electronics, who formerly served as a US Ambassador to the ROK. Also joining will be Damian Ma, uh, Managing Director of Mar Macro Polo at the Paulson Institute, and Naomi Wilson, uh, Vice President of Policy for Asia at the Information Technology Industry Council. My deep thanks uh, to you all, the audience members for joining, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day two. Thank you. Good evening and good morning.